fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren, KYAH, Utah's Talk Authority. Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm your host today, Al Warren, and joining me co-hosting from the big city of Buffalo, <laughs> we've got Michael Hawley. Oh, Al, and I hope you are staying cool in British Columbia. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever said it was cold in Canada, they do not know what they're talking about. <laughs> it's been so hot. Can't believe it. Not enough cool air in the world, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's it draining, you know, it's really draining, especially for us old guys. Well, See, Buffalo is known for their snow, not for the cold. So, <laughs> well, so is Canada. So is Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we don't really get any. That's just kind of mm-hmm. back east they do, but we don't really hear. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, now we are going to uh, get into a little bit of uh, thriller. Fiction, psycho, and we're not talking about your your home life. We're we're talking about a writer <laughs> and a book called Carnal Knowledge. Uh, the guest today we have is uh, Rachel Tamayo. Thank you for being here. Hi, uh, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, Rachel, um, so this is the first time on the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where did where did um, writing become a, an event for you? How did you get into it? Well, um, I've been writing my whole life, pretty much. Um, Honestly, I remember doing it as a young child. Um, I was just writing little stories in elementary school. I was writing uh, books in high school and, you know, just stuffing them in my closet, not actually doing anything with them. Um, And I stopped for several years and... uh, Life happened, and I was a 911 dispatcher for 12 years uh, in a small police department here in the um, southeast Houston area. And um, speaking of the weather, it's hot here. Hot, always hot. (laughs) Oh, yeah, Texas. That's right. Hot, yes. We're used to it here. The weather was so crazy this year, we were frankly glad that the heat came back. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. oh, it was awful. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, no, was, but when you say, you, but when you're writing as a kid in elementary school and stuff, mm-hmm. you're not, you weren't writing these kind of books, were you? Oh no, no, <laughs> or just these... little kids' stories. But you know, most little kids don't spend their time, you know, sitting down writing little bo- little stories. You know, and I would take the time to write little stories and draw little pictures. You know, and I would. um I even a few times would, you know, get my friends together and we would all put act, you know, act them out in front of the class, things like that, you know. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, I don't know where I got that from. I'm, I'm not an extroverted person at all, which I guess is probably why I hide behind writing, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but so you said, and then you were doing that and then you put it mm-hmm. away, life happened, and then you came mm-hmm. back to it. But what what was it that convinced mm-hmm. you to actually, uh, as an adult, come out and, and send your book to, to publishers or to get it published and start ex- letting your stories come out? Well, it was just always a thing I wanted to do. My, If you had ever asked me, what I what my dream would have been that would have been the answer to be a published writer um traditionally published because when when I was in school doing all this self-publishing wasn't a thing um it was van there was vanity presses out there but there was no such thing as self-publishing because there was no internet right um so that came about you know over the last few years which is great, you know, but I think the, 
my dream to be a traditionally published author just stuck with me from, you know, childhood. But I put it away thinking that I would never accomplish it. And during the downtime working in the dispatch, it just never goes away. It, that urge to write is always there. I was just afraid to sit down and do it. Like, nobody had ever read anything I'd written. I never took the time to improve it. Um, but at one point, I got put on night shift, and I had a lot of free time, because after about 2 o'clock in the morning, there's really nothing happening, you know? Um, so I said, well, this is a perfect time for me to start playing around with it again. And I decided if I was going to do it, I was going to do it right. And I was going to actually try and approve and actually get published. And I did. How, how long did it take? Yeah. Was it the first time, or how long did it take until someone you hooked somebody? Well, I wrote the first book I wrote was a book that I'd written or started writing characters I created as a teenager, believe it or not. And um, but that wrote, rewrote that, and then the public, the the publishers and agents and whoever I pitched it to and sent it to, told me, "Look, you write. We like your writing." Once I'd improved my writing and went through that process, which took about a year of that process, took about a year. Um, they said, but the story's not quite right. We, the, we don't, maybe, maybe send us something else if you have something else. So I sat down and I had to make a hard decision and realized that the story, the, the, my, it wasn't my writing, it was the story. So I had to, okay. I had to write a new, I had to write a new book. So, um, I decided to get rid of that book and write the Friend Zone series. Um, what became the Friend Zone series anyway, which is the first romance I wrote, um, that trilogy. And I spent, I don't know, maybe the better part of a year going, going back and forth between agent, trying to decide if I should find an agent or a publisher. And then I was a friend I'd made on a, critique website an author she had an agent and she had told me if she knew what she knows now she said if i'd known what i know i would tell you to just go straight to the publisher she says just skip the agent and just go straight to the publisher you could do it yourself you don't really have to have a publisher i mean an agent unless you're you're going into like you know random house or something you right, know Exactly, like, um, I didn't expect to happen, you know? Um, yeah. So I was like, well, I took her advice, and I decided to start hit, going to publishers, just to publishers. Not, we'll skip agents for a while, we'll just go to publishers, and I, I found a publisher that said yes, and the rest was history, basically. Um, hmm. Now I'm with Tangled Tree Publishing, who is... A division of Hot Tree. Hot Tree is a pretty large romance publisher. And Tangled Tree is a new division that they have, and all they do is mystery and thriller. So you started in romance, and then mm -hmm. you transitioned to the uh, the thriller, uh, mystery thriller after that, then? Yes. Yes, I did. And do you keep on, do you have lots of romance in your thrillers then, because of that, because of your history? Mm -hmm. It was a hard transition to make because I was romance was was easy. It was easy and a little more comfortable. And I was afraid of thriller because it's hard to write. I was afraid I wasn't good enough. And then I took I I took I wrote Crazy Love, which was my transition book. Basically, it's like a romantic thriller because okay. it does have a very heavy romantic subplot um but it is definitely a thriller um and then the one after that a lucifer's game and then break my bones was the one i the first one the first book in the deadly sin series that i took to tangle tree publishing and they read it and they first rejected it actually they first said no and then i i, I was i thought for a while some weeks went by and i'm like you know what's stopping me from just asking them why so I replied back to her rejection, and I said, why, what's wrong with it? Is it something I can fix? You know, 
And she said, well, frankly, it's got too much romance in it. You know? So I was like, well, is it something that maybe we can work on? Because I'm willing to work with you. I I don't have any problem with that. Because I understand she goes, because we would, they wanted me basically, they would wanted to market me as a thriller author, not a romance author. So, which means you have to, they, they said you need to take like half of the romance out of this. So, I said take half of the romance out of it, send it back, and then we'll see. So, that's what I did, and they accepted it. At the time, they took it. Hmm. Okay. So, so your characters are. Uh, so you write your characters differently then. You're you're not focused so much on their romance or their feelings or their 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 love thoughts. Um and just you how are the characters different then when you write them? Like how what do you do with, with them then? Well I mean romance and all that, that's that's part of life and I, there may be elements of that in there. But it's not going to be a, a major plot of the book anymore. It's like every book that I've written has taken another step away from it. Um, with carnal knowledge, it's almost, there's really almost no romance in it. Um, is and that because book, Ricky is such a pain in the butt? <laughs> right. Husband. And I mean, she's torn in it, but it's not really a matter of her wanting to get back with him. You know, um, because he's cheated on her and, and all like this. It, it's a mat- more a matter of her trying to figure out what to do to get her life back together. Um, and I think it's, as far as the characters, it's because of what the, the things that they're going through. It's, it's not that hard anymore to build a character without the romance because the problems that they have and the experience that I have from dispatching for so many years and seeing all the different ways that people deal with things that come at them. Right. That's how I write my characters, basically. So, so you're getting characters from live situations you've been through. Sort of. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I created a character like Ren and Carl knowledge is, 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 is assaulted. Doesn't report it. And, you know, I have had comments from pe- people that read it, people that made posted reviews. Well, you know, why wouldn't she report it in this and that? And, and my, it's because it's realistic, because this happens to women and they don't report it. So this is the line of thought that I took with this character. She didn't report it because of a lot of reasons, you know, um, because she was, she felt like she made a mistake and what had happened, and she blamed herself, even though it wasn't her fault. So she was, she was like, well, what is there to report? I mean, somebody slipped me something. You know, I don't even remember anything. Even though something obviously happened, I, what, what could I say? I don't remember anything. There was just a whole chain of thought there. So, I, I, yeah, I based that on one, one path that a person could take in that situation. You know, there's obviously several roads that a person could take, but that's just the one, one that one person could take. Well, that's interesting. You know, when you decide to take that kind of path, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess you're putting yourself into that then, right? You put some of yourself and your own feelings and thoughts into this storyline. Well, it's like, it's not like I put myself necessarily into it. It's just the way I write. I, I write in um, I write in first person, and that makes it easy too for me to. It, it's what it's what call it's deep. It's a deep point of view. It's it's I get deep inside my characters' heads. You know, I I I actually get so deep into the my characters' heads. It's sometimes a real struggle when I finish one book to get into another one. You know. Because I'm so focused and so deep into this, this story that I've just finished to get that one out of my head and, and to get into the next one, I have a hard time with that sometimes. The, the present tense that you had, you know, like when I'm mm-hmm. doing my fiction novels, I use past mm-hmm. tense, like I you see it quite often. Mm-hmm. So I, and when I did it write a screenplay, it's present tense. And so that's kind of mm-hmm. how I had to 
get used to that. But then you start getting used to that style. and It does make you kind of hook you into the mind of this person. Right. And exactly. It, it really sucks you into their feelings. The reader as you're reading it, because it makes it easier for you to get pulled in and kind of feel what they're feeling. Does that mean you dress up like your character and pretend to be them too? Or, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, you're walking around and I'm this person mm-hmm. and I'm going to do this and, and see how it works. You know, kind of like one of those character actors, like, you know, uh, you know, they, 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 they pretend they're that person, right? You know, it would be interesting. Well, but how do you know which way you're going to go? How do you know what storyline you want to use? Because you're not basing it on the romance anymore. It's not about the characters in that way. So when you have a, a person or a character like uh, someone you were just talking about or someone from one of the 911 calls or some sort of experience, how do you... How do you select which one follows you? Is there, does it stick with you or something? Does it stay? Is there something that stays with you for a period of time and so you kind of go with it? Or Oh, yeah, well, there's calls that I've t- I took that, I'm there that will always stick with me. Um, but yeah, like Break My Bones is actually based on a, one of those stories. Um, uh, when I was first dispatching like the first year of dispatch uh this guy we i worked in this really teeny tiny police department and whenever the records department wasn't there records was the people or they were the people that would monitor the walk-in traffic from the lobby whenever they weren't there on the weekends or after hours dispatch handled it and i don't i, th- I want to say it was like a saturday afternoon and this guy walks in, and he's a young, you know, average-looking person, didn't look, you know, too scary or anything. He walks in, and he, he, I came to the window and asked him if I could help him, and he says, yeah, he just got out of jail. He wants to pick up his property. Um, and I was like, okay, have a seat. And we have a detective that handles that. So he went and sat down. The detective came out and got him and took him back to the back to handle it. And when he went, got taken back to the back, the lady I was working with, she's like, I need to tell you a story about this guy. She's that guy that just got taken back to the back. She says whenever he was arrested, uh, his wife called him in because he beat her very severely. And she called the next day because he woke her up in the middle of the night and he had stuck a gun in her face. And said whatever he said to her, scared her really bad. The next day, he assaulted her, um, made all kinds of threats, and then left for the day. And she decided, because she was worried, and she they had had a child together, she was really scared this time. So she came to the police department and reported it, and they kept her there. And while she was there at the police department making the reports, the police were out driving around looking for this guy. So they found him driving around, and when they pulled him over, he was not far from his house. He had, they pulled him over in the back of his car. He had a tarp and a shovel and all kinds of other very suspicious items. Oh. They, they suspected very highly that he, they stopped him from killing her just in time. And she wasn't from here. She fled the country and went back home, and he was in jail for a little while for that assault but that's that's the story she told me that story stuck with me um and that story is actually the story that i wrote break my bones around because it's a story about domestic violence break my bones so so it can be safe to say that what you focus on is the psychological part of the thriller of the of the of the crime uh, it, it's it's more suspense in a sense than just um, murder, murder. You know that sort of yes. thing. Yes, it's not really like a necessarily a, a mystery. Usually, it's not like a this person was killed and let's solve a crime kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's not usually what it is. So, I mean, in in carnal knowledge, it it sort of is that way. I mean, it's not, it's got, carnal knowledge is a very shocking 
um, surprise ending. It, you, nobody has ever guessed the ending to Carnal Knowledge. Um, but oh, the butler did it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, darn it. <laughs> Nobody's guessed the end of it. But, yeah, they're not really mysteries. I mean, there's mysteries in there, though. So when, then what is it, um, what do you hope people get out of your book then? When someone picks up Break, Break My Bones or if they're picking up Carnal Knowledge, um, what are you hoping that they, you know, take home with that in their mind? Well, I hope that they like the story and I hope that they can connect to the characters because the characters are real. They're flawed and they're not perfect they're not like barbie doll you know cardboard cutout you know people that have no flaws that to make don't make bad decisions and don't make mistakes they're people that are living a normal life that are faced with a sudden problem that you know throws everything off kilter and make decisions that you know anybody might make in a you know, it might be a wrong decision. And that well, that's why I was like, I want people to connect to them because like, yeah, you know what? That happened to me. Or that happened to my friend. And these characters are real. That's what I want. Well, so how, how do you get the character's um, personality in there? Because like, for instance, when you talk about the... Uh, uh, the last case there, and, and 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 you know the story, you know what could have yeah. happened to her, and you kind of know what did happen to her through a story. But how do you fill in uh-huh. her personality? I don't know. It just kind of comes. It, it, it it's not like I have it. I, I don't have it like outlined or anything. I, I'm not really sure what kind of person I'm creating usually when I write it I just kind of go with it and I've had people tell me I didn't really like that character very much and I'm like it's okay you know this isn't um like a feel-good kind of story it's okay if you don't really like the character that much because I tell you what I read thrillers quite often and I can't tell you how many times I've read a thriller you know and love the book but absolutely hated the main character You know, I'm like, God, this person is so annoying. I can't believe. But that's okay because of the genre, because of the type of story that it is. You know, it's it's okay. Now, like in a romance, you you absolutely have to like characters. You have to. You know? And I kind of struggled with that because um, I felt like I was writing the same person over and over and over again. You know? That's where I was having trouble because I don't want to write the same person over and over and over again. You know, I want to write different people that you may like, you might not like, you make mistakes, they're not perfect. So it's, that's why it fits so much better for me. So question on the uh, kernel knowledge. You have a serial killer, uh, SMS mm-hmm. serial killer, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're writing in first person. Do you go into the mind of uh, the serial killer? No, I didn't carnal knowledge is is the first book that i've written that didn't have a multiple point of views and i struggled with that as i was writing it because i was like i i I considered it in more ways than i can count of how i could possibly get away with that is every book i've written has been from multiple points of view um but in the end um i decided not to and a friend of mine of, she's also a writer. She's like, well, you should just do it from the one because consider it a challenge for yourself because you always do it from multiple points of view. Do one book with just one point of view. I had uh, I got yelled at by my editor because I was doing multi, multi points of view, and he says, you're head hopping all the time, and the reader is exhausted. Mm-hmm. So get the <laughs> one point of view and, and then knock it off. So I said, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have too many. Three is the most I've done. Okay. Um, I'm I'm in talks with a, a co-author for a future book that's going to have possibly four uh, different um, characters. Um, we don't know yet, but.
But yeah, so far three is the most I've done. Points of view. But yeah, you can definitely have too many, and you can definitely have too many characters. So the other question I have is because uh, Al and I we we have a thing for serial killers. We love true crime, and uh, yeah, and so and uh, so you're creeping into that that uh, territory with the serial killer, is this going to be a common theme or is, uh, are you just going to be going elsewhere? Well, each book will change because right now the theme is the seven deadly sins. So okay. this one was um, lust. So the next one coming out next year is greed, um, which is, is set to release February of 2022. Um, okay. And I'm working on the next two. So, yeah, there, been, it, there could be another serial killer book in the future. Definitely. So, this, so the lust is uh, the serial killer's lust, as in maybe like a sadosexual serial killer or something? To that it's thing? like a bloodlust kind of thing. And then... That's but the thing is it's it's like a bloodlust kind of thing, but okay. then when you get to the end, it's like everything makes sense and it just it, it's just gonna blow your mind. I mean, seriously, <laughs> really, it's the best ending I've ever done. I, I don't know if I could ever top it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you gonna tell us what it is? No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you gain your inspiration from? Um, I read, I read Stephen King's thrillers, but not his horror. Uh, horror, believe it or not, scares me. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. Considering, yeah. Um, uh, my my the first influence I can remember having, believe it or not, it was actually Ted Decker. It was back whenever he was a more mainstream suspense author, um, and his stuff. It was just so mind blowing and different. Um, you know, I love his books. Uh, and like I read B. A. Paris, and um, just I read numerous different thriller authors. Yeah. Right now, I'm actually read, I I usually just read thrillers, but right now I'm actually reading the Outlander series. Um, uh, save me forever, but that God, those books are long. But <laughs> 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 well, there you have. I, I mean, it cleansed my palate a little bit. I think from you know so many thrillers, you know, so I was like, oh, maybe I'll read one of these. You know, they're really really good books. I you know I know there's a show, I've never seen it, but um, I'm not one that. I don't typically watch the show or the movie or whatever. I just read the book and then let it be. Yeah. But well, you know, mm -hmm. they're usually quite a change in them anyway. You know, there's usually. Oh yeah. You know, it's not always a good one too. So sometimes yeah, they're never as good. Yeah, it's really well. It's really hard for them, I guess, and and they want to make mm -hmm. it to where, you know, they keep they have a certain mm -hmm. idea. They want people to stay on the edge of their seat or. They get into the gore mm -hmm. or whatever, right? They don't want to. Well, yeah. I mean, the book has I been. Mean, I know this is a series, which was a good idea because I can't imagine ever putting that into a movie because it's like a. I listen to audio books because. Yeah. I don't have time really to sit and read a book. I'll listen to them when I'm driving or doing whatever, um, chores and things like that. And this audio book is like forty hours long. You know. <laughs> wow. I'm like, good lord, that book, that, that would be the longest movie if you could ever, to never put all of that in there. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But nope. I do still, I could never, I could never write a book that long. I'm, I'm, my books are fast paced, you know, and I don't know how to pad them enough to make them that long. Um, but I take, read books like that, and I still take stuff out of it, like, Oh, you know how she does this and how she does that when she's writing. You know, I'm never just reading. I'm always like taking notes in the back of my mind. You know, of how they did this or that. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, no. Will you always be first person? Do first person? Actually, no. Um, I. 
I have a, a serial, no, not a serial, in detail magazine. It's uh, like a writer's magazine, a reader's magazine. Uh-huh. It's free, basically. You can anybody can subscribe to the magazine online. Um, myself and a co-author, Cynthia Austin. I stepped outside of my comfort zone a little bit with her, and together she's a paranormal romantic author. Um, okay. She wrote. She's written great stuff. I've read her books. She's an amazing author. Um, together we wrote. Uh, a dystopian suspense. And that book is starting, they put one one chapter in each issue for the next 12 months. Oh, okay. That starts, I believe, in July. So that book is actually called Victory's Secret. Um, You can go to my website and find out how to sign up for that magazine and get it for free. And read that one for free. That one is actually in third person because she didn't know whenever we were talking about writing it together. She told me she didn't think she could write in first person. So I was like, that's okay. I can, you know, we'll we'll work it out. So I can write in third person. person. Yeah. 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 It's hard to write in first person. Do a co-author thing. How is it you, you... You go about doing that, like do you guys take characters and each write them, or uh, if you outline together. How how is it that you work as with someone else? Well, with her, um, we weren't sure because neither one of us had ever, had ever done it before. She lives in California, and I live in Texas, and you know, um, we were working on a bit of a deadline because this is actually something I started and then kind of got stuck, and then I was thinking. It would be, and I, I thought it would be a good idea to bring her in with me to help me with it. And when I approached her, she loved the idea. But um, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and like I said, we were working on a bit of a deadline because of the magazine. Um, we just went chapter by chapter. Um, or just basically, when I felt like stopping, I would wrap my part up and send it back to her and we give each other free edits, you know, like, look, you've had free veto because uh, your name's on it just as much as mine. If you hate what I wrote, just delete it and we'll back it up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> basically, yeah. you know, because like I said, I've written like nine books now, so you can't really hurt my feelings. I'm okay. I've heard everything from editors. It's, I'm, I'm okay. You know, even the best, best author in the world is that an editor look at him and be like, what did you do? <laughs> uh, uh, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, Absolutely. It's yeah, totally. you're, you're the star. You're supposed to put your you foot know? down and say, no, this is... No. This is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come yeah, on. No, she totally worked around it, and I would get stuck, and she would have a good idea, and then, you know, she wrote an ending I didn't like, so I did, We, you know, yeah, it worked. Um, we worked actually really well together. Our, our, our writing worked very well together. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just I find that an interesting process, um, you know, uh, uh, mm-hmm. because you kind of have to give and take, and that give and take, that mm-hmm. that sort of um, combination of what you decide on is is usually a little different than what it would be if you just did it yourself, you know. So yes. I, I I find that interesting, and and it c- it can take you down a different mm-hmm. road, you know. Well, I definitely think you have to be a certain kind of personality, and you cannot be a writer that's like a real crazy about what you write, you know. Like you have to be able to bend with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you have to be able to. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's kind of makes the combo, right? Um, mm-hmm. You never want to work work with Michael Hawley there. He's just. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's, well, see, Rachel, Al, he wanted to have his name on the top of the book. So I stuck at the bottom. That was the problem right there. Yeah. Well, you know, he thought because he was older. <laughs> well, no. No, I've got more books. No idea. <laughs> it's like, I'm the star. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so what, what do you do? Like, what's your, what's your day like? Um, what does Rachel do in her writing process? Do you like write every day? Do you set up a time and go, okay, five o'clock this day, I'm going to write for three hours. And do, do, are you scheduled that way or does it just, just come when it comes and that's it? No, it kind of just comes when it comes. I'm not a, I'm not a person that outlines or schedules or 
Like, I have to write. I have to, you know, be in this room with certain music playing and, you know, none of that. I can write anywhere, anytime the mood hits me. Um, but the mood does have to hit me. And I, was I just... What, go ahead. what happens when it doesn't hit you, but... What if you've got kind of a book you're supposed to be working on and it's just not happening? Well, I'm kind of in that position right now, actually. Um, I'm, I'm not working on deadlines at the moment, so I'm okay. And then um, I, I give myself deadlines and end up stressing myself out <laughs> um, more often than anything else. And then um, with my next book coming out, Next February, with that, with that process taking longer than usual, um, well, longer than it used to, um, but that's pretty typical, you know, of how long it takes to put a book out. Um, that actually gives me quite a bit of leeway, because once, once I really get into the book again, to writing it, it don't take me that long. Um, <clears throat> it's just a matter of me trying to figure out where it's going and sitting down and it's like lightning strikes me. And until it does, it's not going to be good. So I just have to wait. And trust me, you're going to want me to wait. Because if I don't wait and I force it, it's just not going to be that good. Yeah. No, well, <laughs> you, know? I mean, well, you have to fill it with a lot of just yeah. generic stuff, right? You get, Yeah, and I'm just going to end up writing stuff that I delete or, you know, going to read it and like, what was that? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I I know some writers like that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, that's... um, So, Mm -hmm. well, what do you do if you're blocked? What You know, do you have a method to get you out of a funk then or something, or do you just sort of wait? Right now, I'm... I don't know. It's like... I don't know if blocked is the right word. It's like I'm just waiting because it sometimes takes longer for it to hit me than others. Sometimes it, it just it hits me and I'm, I can just run away with it and it works out really well, really fast. And other Did times. You read a book or something? Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, reading will unlock me sometimes. And sometimes I go to the authors I know. Like, and brainstorm with them. Like, hey, help me. I'm stuck. Can we brainstorm a little bit? And that will really help quite a bit. And other times, okay. <clears throat> I just I just have to wait. And sometimes, yeah, and right now I'm kind of in that position. Um, it's very frustrating, actually. I'm like, I should be writing. I should be at least trying. But I know I just... Ugh, it's so frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe go out there and commit a crime. You know, get out oh, there. Oh, it's so frustrating. Go out there and rob a store or something. <laughs> That'll do it. Shoot. Get the blood flowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be all You're excited. Only a little bit. <laughs> yeah. He'll be just That's right. Uh, yeah. Do you have a personal? Uh, do you, do you hear? Well, how do you say this? Do you hear things in your voice then? Because there's a lot of fiction writers that'll say to us, "Well." I hear I hear voices, and I always say you need help. But, but do you get kind of a? <laughs> does it come to you like that, and and do you sort of get it that way, or does it just come to you in pictures, or where? Can you explain no, that? No, I, I don't hear voices, but I probably do need help. But I don't. <laughs> I don't hear voices. Um, well, yeah, I, it's just like an idea hits me, and I'm like, what if I did this? And I kind of just start thinking about it. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it. And then I'm like, it's just a gut feeling, honestly. I just have this gut feeling that I've got it, and that that's it. It's that gut feeling that I'm waiting for. And until I have that gut feeling, I'm like on hold. You know? Um, Like, I have a a friend, she writes, um, Isabella Adams. That's the, her pen name. She she has um, written multiple books based off dreams that she's had, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's crazy. But yeah, I'm waiting on that gut feeling. It tells me that's it. That's it. Maybe you, know? you should start nine one one dispatch again. No, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've I had about enough of that. Yeah, I did I did my turn and I did my turn there. 
<laughs> um, yeah. But but so, doing something like that, okay, the nine one one dispatch, that in itself in a job must have some pretty stressful um, moments and some very emotional moments. Um, I, I I wonder if um, if that would you know these sort of things like that when you're doing that, does that sort of affect your writing? Well, I think it does because it affected the way I wrote my characters. Um, changed, you know, like, because I, I know how people are. And I put that in carnal knowledge. And she's kind of her internal monologue in one scene, talking about how, you know, the things that have, ha- that have happened to her, the, the whole thought of you think you know how you're going to react when this certain thing happens to you but i'm telling you you don't know until it happens until your body just reacts you don't know you don't really you can't i mean and that's just the thing people react so many different ways to so many different traumas you know i've had when i would answer not on one i would have people crying and laughing I had people just completely numb and cussing me out like I did it, you know, and and angry and it's just it was just a complete range of emotions and I learned to understand it had nothing to do with me. So young dispatchers have a tendency to play on those emotions that they pick up through the phone. Because they'll they'll react to those feelings that the, the caller is is giving them. <clears throat> Right. But more seasoned dispatchers won't do it. They they understand that their their reaction that even if they're swearing at you, even if they're cussing at you and hanging up on you and all those other things, it has nothing to do with you. It's just their response to a terrible thing. Because understand that nobody ever calls the police on a good day. Ever. So we only ever dealt with people on a bad, bad day. It's kind of like a lot of our yeah. listeners when they call in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> They're always crying or swearing or screaming or, you know, it's never, they yeah. never call on a good day. And they're always calling because yeah. they're mad. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I understand yeah. that. But, uh, it's just, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's nothing to do with mm-hmm. you. It's to do with them. Right. It's, it's their day and what they're mm-hmm. doing. And, but to say, so when it, you know, being in the social media world and being a writer, so you're being public, mm-hmm. you, you, you're you out there. Um, yeah. Do, does it worry or not so much worry, but does it bother you? Um, or do you stay attached to people that give you reviews or say things about you that maybe are not the nicest, you know? No. I mean, no. Because if, if first – it's been a few years now and I've had a few books now and I've had my share of bad reviews and I understand that hardly bad reviews are just because not every book is for everybody you know um you just this just may not be your cup of tea you know and that's okay that's perfectly okay um and other people are just are just rude I mean <laughs> Yeah. We're from you know, Buffalo. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, some people are just, you know. And I had one review on, um, I want to say it was Goodreads right. last year. I think it was last year. And I was reading it, and it was like a one or two star. It was really low. And I was reading the review, and I was laughing because it was so obvious that she read just like the first chapter or two and never finished it. Because if she... You could tell, I mean, right. you could yeah. tell that she hadn't finished the book. And I'm like, it's cool that you didn't finish the book. If you didn't like it, that's fine, you know, because I picked up many books that I didn't like, and I'm like, I can't read this, and I put them down. But don't review it like you read it. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, again, the, the, you know, that's representing yeah. how she was feeling uh, at right. that time, and it, there could be a lot of things going on in her life. I, mm-hmm. I just put it to that because mm-hmm. the, the the reality is, you know, I've 
I listen to other shows, and if I don't like mm-hmm. a show or see a TV show or a movie mm-hmm. or if I read a book, I listen to books like you. But if you, if you get one mm-hmm. that's, like, really bad, I just turn mm-hmm. it off and go to the next one. I don't actually waste my time reviewing it. So right. to, to actually sit down on the computer and actually put in a review for someone that's really mm-hmm. negative, uh, th- there's mm-hmm. something else going on in that person's life. Because I, I, why would you waste your time, right? That's, yeah, totally true. Yeah, most definitely. You know, they're they're getting something out mm-hmm. of it for themselves. So I, you know, I've kind of over the years now, I don't, I don't really pay much attention anymore because overall mm-hmm. the ratings are good and and um, you know that's all that matters. Yeah. You know, what's, you know, what's funny is I had mm-hmm. because I do uh, Jack the Ripper research, and uh, mm-hmm. if there's somebody that has a passion for a, a different suspect, I had a review and they gave me like a one. <laughs> and all they did is they talked about their book. So yeah. it was like a scam. <laughs> and then uh, so I contacted Amazon, but they didn't do anything about it. No. Yeah. Well, I wrote an article about it and um, basically talking about how bad reviews actually kind of do you a favor. Because if you have nothing but like four and five star reviews, it looks suspicious. Yeah. It, it does. Oh, yeah. I mean, because I'm like, who has nothing but four and five star reviews? You pull up any, like, top New York Times bestselling author, and, you know, like 20% of their reviews are crap, you know? I mean, there's always going to be bad reviews for everybody. So those reviews tell people that your reviews are real, that people are actually reading your books, you know? That you did, you're not buying right. those. You're you're not telling your friends to go review your books. You know, I mean, it, it's like actual readers. Yeah, yeah, that's important. I think any any mm-hmm. any action is good like that that you get if you're getting real people actually yeah. reading your book, whether they love it or hate it. At least they're reading right. it, right? You know. Now, so, right. If you're getting nothing but one and star, two star reviews, then you might want to go back and look at something. <laughs> no, right. no, no, no. That you, is a different problem. You, <laughs> hunt, you hunt down those people giving you the bad reviews <laughs> and take them out. If you, if you don't have any five star reviews. <laughs> yeah. But for the yeah. most part, yeah. Yeah. yeah it just you, makes your reviews look real. Yeah. Give yourself a five star and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then you'll have a five star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not that important. You know, it really isn't. At the end of the day, as long as people yeah. are, are buying and they're into it and you'll get your fans, you know, it's just the way of the right. world nowadays. And, and yeah. in the end, you know, you're right. We write because we have to. Yeah. If nobody ever bought our books again, if we, you know, if we got nothing but bad reviews, we would probably still write because we are writers and we cannot not write. Yeah. You know, well, it, Michael's it's still just, writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots to say, Al. I've got lots to say. <laughs> it's just like therapy, you yeah. know? I yeah. mean, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's therapeutic, you know? I've, I've got, you know, like last year in Texas here, all this horrible crap happened here with the freeze. And we don't think we had a hurricane last year, but yeah, you know, you're, it's young. The, you know, we just started summer here, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, sure. you know, yeah. what can happen? Yeah. Well, you know, and that that you know, that was fake snow, but I heard I heard that isn't even real snow. That's what I heard too. But it seemed pretty real, but <laughs> see, it's all in your mind. You know, I it's, just imagined it. Um, <laughs> but does, yeah. but does that? I wonder if did, at that in itself. So you're in Texas and you're getting mm-hmm. snow, and then there's no power, and there's all these issues mm-hmm. going on, and then you've got COVID, and and you've mm-hmm. got you know anti-maskers, and then you've got you know all the stuff going on like the last year now, a lot of tension. Let's just say. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're sitting at home. And anytime you turn on the TV, you see something like this, right, uh, mm-hmm. going on. It's very, very tense. Um, does that interfere in your writing, or does it make your writing maybe a little darker, maybe? Or do you think it seeps in somehow? I don't think it does with mine. I, I use, I mean, in mine, my writing is therapy for me because it's an escape. Because I can get away from whatever in that like the world I've created in that story, I can escape into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't really 
affect it. And I don't honestly watch that much TV. I, I don't. Yeah, no. I don't get to honestly. My kids, um, the video games between the video games and the cartoons, I don't really get to watch a lot of TV. Right, it's better anyway. Oh. But, but it probably know. is. Yeah. But just, just <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, because yeah. if anything, you can get caught up in uh-huh. it and just be all upset, right? And then yeah, it's probably better yeah. not to, unless unless that feeds into your writing somehow. And sometimes people it gets they get into. Uh-huh trauma and drama and sometimes they don't right so you know it's all it's all yeah. good i mean you know and if you see some do you see do you ever see a bad person some someone cuts you off in traffic or in a lineup and then you kind of look at them and you kind of create a character in your book and they get killed i've joked about it but i've never actually <laughs> done it yeah. oh, get, do it it's nothing better <laughs> so that you gotta yell out your window say i'm putting you in my book yeah, right. you're gonna be in my next book. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. You put them in the and they get they have a really horrible death, mm-hmm. you know, something. Right. And it's like, oh, what? Isn't that something? No, that's terrible. Right. I'm just <laughs> awful person I am. Well, it's certainly interesting. Um, now let's let's talk. Let's tell people where they can find you, uh, and if they want to send a bad review, where do they put it? And and you have like a a website. <laughs> Um, yes, my website is racheltomayowrites.com. You can um, pretty much find any of my up-to-date anything there. You can contact me. You can find out how to subscribe to In Detail Magazine so you can get the free chapters of Victory Secret coming out next month. You can find out, like I said, when my next book is coming out. Um, and my books are available pretty much anywhere. Um, my uh, My next Deadly Sins book is titled Mine. Um, it's coming out next year. Right. And Chrono Knowledge is available now. So, Wow. Now, of course, we'll have mm-hmm. all of that up on our website. People mm-hmm. can find you with one click, and then you're mm-hmm. – and uh, they don't have to hunt too too far. Um, right. You know? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, it's certainly been a great conversation and uh, a little bit about writing. And uh, our guest has been uh, Rachel – Tamayo, and uh, the the book she's featuring right now is Carnal Knowledge, and it's a gripping serial killer thriller, a mm-hmm. deadly sins novel, book two. Thank you for being here, Rachel. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.